Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Marissa Di Natale and Chris Drides. Hi, guys. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. We had a very eventful week, did we not? We did. I just saw you two days in a row, right? So. I know, in person. In person, yes, yes. Yeah. Day one was uh, we had our own conference in Wilmington. I thought that went well. Uh, and I, I, although having said that, uh, we were talking to one of our other colleagues, and, and I asked her point blank what she thought, and she goes, well, I thought Chris did a better job than you, Mark. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's so just an objective that? opinion. That's, <laughs> that's... <laughs> <laughs> she, of course, she was much more, uh, how, she phrased that a little less directly, but you know that's kind of sort of what she was saying, right, Chris? But that's what you heard. <laughs> that's, what, oh, that's what I heard. That's I heard what it was very gracious, but yeah. that's what you heard. But, but you know, I, I I view that as throwing down the gauntlet. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be number one again. I got to, you know, I, I got to get back on my game. Well, I did give then, out prizes. It, it is about the prize. You were giving out prizes. That's really not, mm. I didn't have any <laughs> prizes to give out. <laughs> what did you give out? I gave out uh, decks of cards, Moody's Analytics branded cards. Which we we bought all that those chapkeys twenty five years ago. Yeah. Well, I guess the benefit of closing our office is that we had to yeah get rid it. of all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but people really like the cards. So. Yeah, I, I'd like some cards. If you got any extra ones, I'd like. Oh, you have to. Well, let's see how you do on okay. the. Let's see how you do on the statistics game. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then and then on day two we had because uh, we're we're now remote. Uh, we we went fully remote six eight weeks ago. Uh, we had uh, a lot of the folks come in to uh, Wilmington where we had the event and um, uh, had a kind of an offsite. And that I thought went pretty well. Very well. Carl, yeah. my brother gave a, that was a great speech. Inspirational. Inspirational. It was, it was really very good. Mercy, you missed it. You weren't there. I know I was in Dallas with a client. Oh, okay. Well, fair enough. Someone's got to, you know, earn a yeah. someone's got to go out and do it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Next time next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a guest that we're going to get to in just a minute, a guy named Glenn Mueller, a good friend of mine that I've known for, I don't know, you know we talk about it, I think 20, 30 years. He's uh, uh, been uh, everywhere in the commercial real estate market, uh, you know, head of research for Prudential and on the investment side. He's now a professor at the University of, Del uh, excuse me, at the University of Denver. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern, angst around commercial real estate and what it what's going on there and what it might mean for the broader financial system and economy. And we'll come back to that. Before, before we go, go there, I thought we'd spend a few minutes to talk about uh, you know, what's top of mind this week. Uh, we've got a lot of questions around uh, monetary policy, Fed policy, interest rates. Uh, it was kind of a light week in terms of economic statistics, but we'll play the statistics game. But I thought we'd talk about monetary policy first. So maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Chris, and you can kind of describe you know, what our baseline outlook is for, for the Fed in monetary policy. So at present, at least in our current June forecast, we have the Fed pausing at this point, the st stamp pat at uh, five and five and a quarter percentage points on the uh, Fed funds rate through the end of the year. And then in, I think, early to mid 2024, we have them starting to cut as inflation is coming down. Actually, March. It's actually, to March. be precise, at the March oh, meeting you. in 2024. Yeah. Yeah, I think we were talking about perhaps pushing Yeah, talk about minutes. pushing it out, which, which we should talk about now because yeah. I think we probably should. But anyway, yeah, I'd agree. now it's March of 2024. Yeah. But the, but the theory there is that inflation is coming down and things are moderating or moving in the right direction. And therefore, there's no need to... Um, be much more aggressive in terms of uh, monetary policy. And then in 24, the inflation rate is nearing the target, but the job market is weakening at that point. They, be, they become more concerned about really pushing the economy into recession and they start to cut, right? right. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, the frame we have currently. Yeah, and what's the market say? Do you know? I mean, if you market look looks like it's uh, uh, anticipating a, a, a hike in uh, July. Just one, though, throughout the rest of the year, right? Obviously, there's a distribution, but it seems as though that's the uh, that's the mode is for five twenty five to five rate high. one more. When it felt like uh, Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, he testified in Congress, uh, both the Senate Banking and the House Financial Services this week, 
in uh, in the other speakers seem to be, and also a lot, the FOMC meeting, the um, mm, policy the market, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, meeting last week, seemed like they were intimating there might be more than one more rate hike, at least a couple more rate hikes, right? Yeah, the dot plots. The dot plots. Uh, suggested two more. Right. Two more 25 point hikes. Uh, correct. Right. That's right. For precision. Yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. So, so what do you think, uh, Marissa? I mean, is that, you, that's the baseline. That's our, you know, and that's a no recession baseline. We're not expecting right. recession. Obviously we're expecting inflation to continue to moderate, get back close to the Fed's target by this time next year. Does that sound like a reasonable forecast to you or outlook? Or you, would you counsel any change there? I think I'd probably put another rate hike in there. You would? Okay. Because I think so. I think given the strength, they're really data dependent here, right? Inflation expectations are very well anchored. That's, you know, you could use that as an argument for for them not hiking and just staying where they're where they are. But I think the job market is just really strong. Yes, it's slowing down, but I think it's reasonable to expect we get at least another couple very good job reports. And core inflation is improving very at a very marginal slow pace, right? It's pretty sticky. Most of the inflation relief we're getting is energy and food prices. So I think they probably do at least one more here coming up. I think as we get past the summer, and if we really start seeing re really relief on core inflation, particularly the shelter component, that's probably the point at which they stop. I don't think the forecast is unreasonable, but I also think it would be very reasonable to add one more rate hike in there. It's funny, you know, generally, you have to make a distinction in your mind, what sh should they do? And what will they do? And yeah, yeah you know, I say 95% of the time, for me, those are the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. what, what they should do and what they will do are one and the same. This it, recently in the last few, uh, last couple of three meetings and certainly, you know, looking forward, I, my, what they sh will do is now different from what they, in my mind, what they should do. Uh, I mean, what they will do, yeah, they probably will raise rates a quarter point at the July meeting because they pretty much signal that's what they're going to do. And that's already embedded in market pricing. And if they follow, just simply follow through, in theory, nothing should change, right? I mean, it's already uh, out there. It's an expectation. But what they should do just feels like to me they should just stop. They stopped and just stay stopped until there, there's a reason not to, uh, to, to, a reason to move one way or the other. Because you know, it feels like to me inflation is coming in pretty gracefully. I mean... Maybe not as gracefully as you'd like if you had a piece of paper and you drew the line, but you know it's pretty close. And uh, you know the outlook feels increasingly uh, more certain there. And then on the on the uh, growth front, uh, growth is slowing. I mean, you know, output GDP is below potential. You can feel the labor market easing up, and I and I increasingly am of the view that the job numbers are going to get revised down. That yeah, um, you, you you saw what's happened with the household employment data. That you know we all look at the payroll survey data, and that's been you know strong, three hundred k plus per month. We look at the payroll survey, I mean the household survey, the other survey of employment, and that's measurably weaker. And then you get the data from the quarterly census of employment and wages. That's the unemployment insurance record data, full count of employment, to which this survey data we're looking at now is ultimately revised and benchmarked to. And that's been a lot weaker. So, you know, who knows? I mean, we're going to have to wait to see what, what the benchmark revisions are going to be. But I'd be uh, uh, surprised uh, that uh, after these revisions come in, you know, over the course of the next six, 12 months, we're not, we're, we'll come, oh, we're going to realize, oh my gosh, yeah, job growth was actually meaningfully weaker than what, what it is now. I don't think it, I don't think it's, you know, falling apart. I don't, I'm not saying that. The economy is still, you know, creating jobs, uh, you know, a, a good number of jobs, but not, not three hundred thousand plus a month. I, I just don't believe that's the case. And then you got the issues with the banking system, the financial system, 
you know, why, you know, why would you, you know, keep pressing on the brakes, you know, at this point? Um, do you want to take, take the other side of that, Chris? Uh, surprisingly not. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, I actually yeah. agree with you on the will yeah. versus should. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also concerned about the student loan repayments restarting. That's just one more thing. I don't think that's the end. They'll be all over. Yeah, recession. That's one more thing that will is going to slow down consumption in the broader economy as well. And so I think we need to be looking ahead at least a few months here, not just reacting to what we see in front of us. But yeah. I think you're right. They probably will hike one more time. Yeah. And that student loan thing you just mentioned, it's a, the moratorium on student loan payments comes to an end in September. And that's going to happen because that's in legislation. That's yep. the debt limit legislation. And that, by our calculation, is uh, about $70, $75 billion in additional payments on student loans. That's annualized over a period yep. of a year. But, you know, that hits September, October, November on an annualized basis. That's not inconsequential. That's going to take some steam out of consumer spending in the broader economy. You know, just when the Fed is thinking about, you know, we should be raising interest. Here's a theory, though. Maybe the Fed is taught simply talking tough, right? Because be. they need to keep uh, inflation expectations down. You, Mercy, you pointed out that the, they're, they're, they seem relatively well anchored and uh, they don't want to give that up. They want that to continue because is, uh, it makes it easier to get actual inflation back in. It gets wage growth to back something that's more consistent with their inflation target, get inflation back in. So if I were them, and they were, and I, and you know, and I had my my view now that they shouldn't raise. I'd still be talking tough like they are. I'd be saying the same things they are. So maybe what we're observing here is just kind of some strategic uh, uh, messaging that's going on to try to keep inflation expectations. How do you, what do you think about that theory? Some jawboning. Just jaw, but yeah, kind of a jawboning. Not, yeah. I'm not sure how not, not everyone like me thinks it's jawboning, so I'm not sure how much it works. But you know, that's the you know kind of the theory behind it. Much much better than if they came out and said, "Oh yeah, maybe we'll we'll stop." Yeah. You know, uh, we'll we'll be a much more relaxed about that two percent inflation target we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, probably doesn't make sense to do that. I, yeah, I no, wonder. I, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Mercy. Sorry, I was just going to say if you if we go back to the meeting that happened after the SVB collapse, you know, we, yeah. we kind of thought they should pause. Then there's turmoil yeah. in financial markets. That would have been a good time to pause and not put further upward pressure on interest rates across the economy. And they didn't. And, and just like you're talking about the jawboning kind of to try to anchor things, I wonder if that was a strategic hike to say, we really aren't worried about this, right? We're we're really not worried about the banking system. And had they paused at that point, that could have been a signal that they're really worried, right? That that there's more stress out there in financial systems than uh, people thought. So just like, because it seems to me if you were going to pause, that would have been the time to do it and they didn't do it. And now they pause. So I, I think everything they're doing is strategic to keep markets in line and expectations in line. Right. Okay. So I, I mean, because we think they will, not because we think they should. We're gonna, right. It seems like we should put another quarter point rate hike in for the month of July. Then let's look out quickly into 2024. Right now, in the baseline, we have the first rate cut in March of 2024. Feels like that might be the, the one reason why you might stick with that is the the election. You know, you got this thing called the election next year. <laughs> And do you really want to be moving rates around when you're in the middle of the election process, which kind of goes into full swing a few months later, you know, uh, as you move into the summer? Uh, and, you know, maybe you, you move a little earlier. Do you do it in March? It, 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 otherwise, you might have done it a little later in the summer. Uh, uh, but, you know, having said that, Maybe we should push it off a little bit further because you know they they'll, they they'll want to make sure that inflation is actually back you know within spitting distance of their target before they actually cut interest rates. It, again, in the under with the underlying assumption that we're not going into recession, that's kind of our baseline. There's no recession. What what do you think about what we should do there, Chris? Yeah, on, uh, given that it's a, that assumption, I would think they would wait a bit longer. Wait, you think so? Yeah. So what if they cut in like 
May. Is that? Oh, you think of May? So they're still not kind of in in the middle of the election process. They can still say, yeah, hey. Yeah, they're so kind of. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that's the primary, right? Is that? Yeah. Oh, well, my God. Yeah. I just yeah. realized the primaries. Yeah. <laughs> less than a year away. Oh, I'm not ready. Yeah. So you think we should push it off a couple months, though? I think so. That's yeah. my. Yeah. Uh, again, given the other assumptions in the that we're not going into recession. Yeah. And that inflation is still, you know, chugging along here for a while. Okay. Okay. Well, the the listeners seeing how we make these assumptions, <laughs> we have these conversations. Now, of course, we're going to have to bring in the rest of the group, and they're going to disagree for sure. Somebody's going to disagree, so we're going to have some kind of uh, discussion debate over this. But it does feel like we'll probably add one more quarter point hike in July, and then extend out the first rate hike until we're probably May, uh, is May of the meeting next? We'll have to see when the meetings are. Oh yeah, we should check. I can't yeah. quite remember when the meetings are, but sometime in that period, the, kind of the May-June period. Yes, yeah, in that period, yeah. Okay, all right, very good. Let's play the uh, statistics game. Uh, just to remind everyone, the game is we each put forward a statistic. Uh, the rest of the group tries to figure that out with questions, clues, deductive reasoning. The best um, statistic is one that's not so easy. We get it immediately one that's not so hard that we never get it. And I, again, this week was pretty light on the data, about as light as it gets. So uh, I'll be curious what kind of statistics people come up with. And as per, per, per tradition, we're going to start with Marissa. Will you go first, uh, Marissa? Okay. This is going to be very hard. And oh. so I need, I probably need to tell you where the data is from for you to get it. Okay. Whoa. But I'm okay. going to, I'll, I'll set, I'll, so this is what I'll say about it. It was released by the BLS this week. Okay. It is something they release every year. So it's not high frequency. The statistic is that I'm going to give is for the whole year of 2022. This is the poverty statistic? No. The, the, it is okay. germane to the topic that we're going to talk to Glenn about. Which is CRE. Commercial real estate and in particular Germany. sort of the office market. Is it construction employment? Okay, hold on. I haven't even given the statistic yet. <laughs> okay, so the statistic is that uh, is 34% in 2022. Okay. That was down from 38% in 2021, but up from 23.7% in 2019. Okay, this is labor market oriented. Yes. Right. And it has something to do with the way people work. Remote work. Remote work. work. Yes. Yeah, you got it. Okay. So this oh. is, and then, oh. but then I have two other statistics. I'm going to. Wait, wait. Oh. Did I get it or did Mark get it? Did I get it or did Mark get it? <laughs> Who gets oh. the cowbell here? Oh, the wait. One of you no. said remote work. Oh, yeah, that was I that was yeah. Okay. I, oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> okay. Chris gets it. <laughs> okay. Chris gets it. Oh, By a second. Hold on. Is that 34% of what? what I'm going to tell you that? what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Go it's, ahead. So in 2022, 34% of employed people did some or all of their work okay. from home. Yeah. Okay. Which was down from 38% in 2021. But right. prior to the pandemic, it was 23.7%. This and this can include people that only work from home. It, it can include people that do a little bit of both. They might work in an office and then bring work home. Um, but yeah, 34% work from home in, okay. in 2022. Okay. Now, this is obviously interesting to the office market, right? Because this, sure. is, this is sort of the trend that is determining the direction of what's happening with office right. uh, space and take up. Let me give you these statistics. 7.9 hours versus 5.4 hours. Commute times? For no. Uh, this is something to do with the amount of time doing times. Oh, you said hours. So it is time. <laughs> <My definition. laughs> yes. Yes. I sound smart, don't I? <laughs> no, time it has use. something to do with time. <laughs> Time spent um, online, something in their work day, some some proportion, some hours of their work day, they're doing this. No, work week, I should say. 
No, I'm asking you, Marissa. Who yeah, else? I know. I'm I'm thinking about how to answer it. Y yeah, oh. it it is their work day. So people that worked in the office what? on an oh. average day oh. worked 7.9 hours. People that usually worked from home only worked 5.4 hours a day. What? What? <laughs> oh, is that because it's that just compositional, you know, different types of work that are at home versus in the office? I mean, like it's you need to see the time series of that to make yeah. So some I mean, the, so the work done at home is is much more that five point four hours back in twenty nineteen it was three point three hours if you did oh, any work okay. from home. Okay? Okay. okay, and this really varies by the type of work you do, the profession you're in, your educational yes. attainment level, right. Right? right? But generally, when people work from home, they're working fewer hours than if they work in an office. Okay, but I mean, you got to correct for the composition of work, right? Don't you? I mean, yeah, but even when you correct, I mean, if I'm an for, office worker and I work in the office, am I working less if I work at home? That is the implication here, because even if you look at full time people in the same industry, the people working at home are working fewer hours. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Wow. Wow, that that's that's not me, Mark. I'll just uh, yeah, yeah, it's know, not it's, us. It's almost the opposite, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is definitely the opposite. It's right? definitely not us because people actually take some of their commute time that they're not yeah uh, right and they actually work during that period. That's weird. I got it. That's interesting data, though. Yeah, I'm take a closer look at that. That's a good one, though. Very very good. And you did it nicely because you knew there's like zero probability, right? That, <laughs> that we would have gotten that. Yeah, but that was good. Uh, okay, Chris, you're up. All right. I also looked a little farther afield. This is from a government source. Came out yesterday. I'm going to give you three numbers. You won't tell us which which agency or anything. It's two. That's uh, a census. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Very that helps, helpful. right? <laughs> census. Okay. okay. Thirty-eight point thirty-eight point nine, forty-four point eight, thirty-one point nine. Those are ages. Yes. Um, oh, 38.9 is now the median age of the population. Yes. Very good. Ding, ding, oh, ding. Oh, wow. Bell. Yep. What are the other, other two, two ages? 44.8 40, and 31.9. I will help you and tell you that okay. these are state. Oh. Uh, the youngest is Utah. Yep, very good. Excellent. The That's the 31.9. Uh, I want to say Florida. Florida. Nope. Pennsylvania? Nope. Arizona? Michigan. No, it is in the Northeast. Okay. You're going Island. that direction. Maine. Maine. Exactly. Maine, Maine, Maine. Maine, Maine. 44.8 median yeah. age. Yeah. Yeah. That's yep. good. That's really cool. What's the mean? So overall median age is what? 38.9. Yeah, I'm in that cohort. <laughs> you are contributing <laughs> to that number. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good. so yeah, definitely uh, get aging as a population here, right? So with all sorts of implications for housing and productivity, labor markets. So no, that's very good. That's very very good. Okay, uh, my statistics don't stack up to your statistics. I'm afraid. Uh, I've got all right. I'm going to give you two uh, that are unrelated. The first one, because I'm afraid the first one's not any good. So if it's not any good, I'll give you the second one. $1.4 trillion, $1.4 trillion, and it's related to the topic that we're now going to turn to in just a minute, and that's commercial real estate. What is $1.4 trillion? And given the conversations we've been having, you, you may be able to figure this one out. Yeah, I think- um, I might even say it. It's Did I say office, it? office loans held by banks. No, that's that's $100 billion. That, those are, that $100 billion is- uh, the uh, amount of office mortgages that uh, are on bank balance sheets that will mature. Oh, trillion, trillion. Yeah, that will mature by net by uh, by the end of 2025. It sounds like excess saving. It does. You're right. I think it is excess. I saving, think it's I did, same, that's yeah. not what I had in mind. That's, latest. That's, good. that's a good one. That's our latest estimate of excess saving. That's the extra saving done during the pandemic that's sitting in bank uh, by households. Accounts. Yeah. Go back to CRE though. Okay. And you were on the right track. 1.4 trillion is? The office market? No, you said that. 
no, well, no. yeah. It's the total amount of CRE debt across all providers of that debt, banks, mm -hmm. REITs, CMBS, everything, that is coming due that needs to be refinanced or rolled over between now and the end of 2025. 1.4 trillion. Okay, I, I'm not sure how good that was. I'll give you one more. You should be able to get this. Minus 0.7, 0.2, and 0.1. It's a statistic that came out this week. Is it from the um, conference board's leading economic indicators? Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. What's the minus 0. 0.7? That was the decline over the month in the index. In the leading indicator. Yeah. yeah. In the leading. And then one's probably. 0. 0.2 is coincident. Coincident. The 0. 0.1 is. Lagging. 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 Very good. Very good. You know, there's a, a interesting phenomena. The leading indicators have been falling now for quite some time. Yeah. The coincident indicator is not going anywhere. You know, it's still positive. So. It's happened before in the past. It's not like it's never happened before, but it's unusual, you know, that you see these leading indicators, you know, signaling recession, but the actual measures of coincident mm -hmm. economic activity, which which determine whether you're going to be in a recession or not, the things that kind of the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at when trying to date recession, doesn't show it. You know, it's just been, you know very interesting um, phenomenon. But anyway. Um, okay, well, very good. I think uh, because we do have a guest and uh, a, uh, a conversation around CRE, I think we're going to call this part of the podcast uh, to a close and uh, we're going to uh, move on to the next part of the podcast. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I'd like to introduce my good friend, Glenn Mueller, to Inside Economics. Hi, Glenn. Good to see Hi. you. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you're, um, you're, you're, you told me you're in White Bear Lake, Minnesota today. Correct. Yeah. And uh, I, I recounted this story that I, believe it or not, when I was growing up, my dad was a professor at Penn, and he had a good friend, uh, uh, engineer at 3M, who had a home on White Bear, and we'd go up every summer. And, uh, and then we'd go from there up to uh, Lake Superior uh, to a little town called Two Harbors. And the thing about th those trips of, was that for for a kid that grew up in a big city on the East Coast, that was the first time I actually really ever saw the sky, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you see the sky often there in the White Bear? Uh, all the time, looking out at it right now and, um, you know, and the water. And the water. Oh, and that's the thing, because Glenn is a master uh, water skier, right? Right. And you're right. still doing that. Master. Right? Yeah, yeah, I I, I ski wow. I, I ski every morning here. Skied this morning. I actually a uh, lifetime goal is to go to nationals, which I did in 2019. Wow! And uh, I was ranked 30th, but took ninth. Wow. Oh wow! Congratulations! So, top ten, yeah. Well, how come not number one, Glenn? I'm just you know because I don't live in Florida where you can ski all. Day. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot but, of sense. Yeah. But I, I grew up in Wisconsin, and the other thing about the Midwest is I I grew up racing sailboats and had a summer home in New Hampshire for 38 years and then moved here to be near my grandkids. And now I sail. I race sailboats. As oh, a matter of fact, I had my trifecta week. I sailed Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. Uh, the raced all three nights this week. So Wow. Um, that, that sounds like fun. Um, yeah. You you are in, in impeccable shape. I remember, you know, <laughs> how many years? We go decades back, don't we? Like Yes, like thirty plus, easily 30 plus early, early nineties. Yeah, that's when we uh, when we first met, and uh, yeah. we keep bumping into each other at real estate conferences around the country, and um, also Homer Hoyt Institute down in Florida, which is a bunch of PhDs chatting it up on real estate for the last, you know, I like to say I joined in ninety six, so um, yeah, uh, we're you know you you're you're much broader in your exposure than I am. Um, but, uh, um, it's, it's been a good ride. I think one each one inch deep and six miles wide. Is that the phrase? Something like that. There so, we go. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm fortunate enough to have good friends like you who know, really know stuff and I can call on you and say, Hey, what the heck is going on? And right. of course, you know, you're now at the university of Delaware professor of real estate. And you were telling me 
Denver is the second yeah. oldest. Yeah, program? yeah. University of Wisconsin is the oldest. Yeah. University of Denver started their real estate program in 1938, and we're the only program in the country that has uh, both real estate and construction management in a school of business. Ah. Um, and we just two years ago started an executive PhD program for everybody that just you know, can't take a couple of years out of their life to go get their PhD. You could do it online mainly and come come to the university for two weeks a year and uh, and and do a PhD that's applied to your uh, whatever whatever business you're in, you know, whatever whatever wow. specialty you're doing. So that's kind of cool. That is very cool. That is very cool. And of course, we're here. We're going to talk about commercial real estate. That's top Perfect. of mind, you know, for anyone uh, focused on what's going on in the broader economy, banking system, financial system. Before we do that, though, you, you as I recall, you've been at different stops in the CRE mart, uh, world uh, on your way to becoming a professor at the University of Denver. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to re- just give the sure. listener a sense of that? Sure. Actually, started out as a home builder in the in the late 70s. Oh. Went back to school, got my PhD in real estate at Georgia State University. Um, ended up back at University of Denver teaching for four years and then got hired by Prudential as a VP of research when that was a brand new thing. Uh, Charlie Wurzbach, if you remember Charlie. I sure do. And then, yeah. and then I moved to a company called ABKB, Alex Brown, Clamart Benson. After two years, we merged with Jones Lang LaSalle. Mm. I, I moved on to uh, Price Waterhouse as their national director of real estate research for a couple of years. Then Leg Mason, I ran a, uh, a REIT uh, group uh, there for a decade and helped take 22 uh, REITs public. And then moved to one of our clients called Black Creek Group uh, as their head of research. And they did non-traded REITs and actually there for 17 years until Aries Capital Management bought them two years ago. And Aries Capital Management is the largest uh, debt lender in the world now. They're like $325 billion. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, and they're... and. Um, they they had some direct real estate stuff going on before that, but they're like fifty billion of that's in direct real estate funds. Wow. So, um, and of course, my and at the same time, I've worked at Johns Hopkins. I'm still uh, uh, guest lecturing every year at Harvard and Wharton, um, and uh, you know, been at University of Denver now a total of twenty one years. Wow, you, you've seen uh, commercial real estate, housing, uh, all of it. From everything different angles, yeah, everything. But just, just so you know, uh, John, uh, Chris is a Johns Hopkins PhD, uh, economics PhD. Okay, yeah. Did no, you ever I, have Glenn? Did you remember Glenn, uh, Chris? No. no. Right. Yeah. Our, we we had a master's in real estate there. I started there in '92 and left in 2005. Oh, very good, very good. Well, it's uh, you know obviously great to have you uh, here and to talk about CRE. Let, let's begin the discussion this way. It feels like hair on fire out there when it comes to commercial real estate. Right. Everywhere I go, every conference I speak to, every policymaker I, you know, have a conversation with, you know, how worried should I be about commercial real estate? I'm sure you're getting that all the time. Right. How, do, how do you answer that question? Right. And the and the answer is kind of funny. I, I say, well, yes and no. Um, uh, yes, you should be really worried if it's office. No, you should have no worry whatsoever if it's industrial and or multifamily and retail has been just actually doing really well. And we can talk about why. And then hotels, it's the, I, I, you know, sort of the have and have nots, the resort stuff and leisure is great. The business hotels are, you know, kind of uh, up, up in the air uh, still, although there's, you know, more, more coming back than now, but really, you know, I, as I say, office is the one big jump ball out there, and uh, you can literally bifurcate that into, um, you know, brand new stuff coming out of the ground, uh, or, or that's just finishing off that they started four or five years ago, is actually leasing up very well, hmm. um, because everybody wants new, really nice, attractive space to get people into, uh, just came from the NAREC meetings in New York, and listened to Boston Properties, you know, the big I and class A. And they said, you know, a lot of class A isn't doing well, right? He said, but we went back and looked at it and we're like, you know, 95% occupied and there's demand and we're getting people and they're about to come out of the ground with a new building in New York right next to the Yale club. Hmm. He said, and it's because 
we asked we asked our 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 brokers at uh, at CBRE to go in and look at our stuff and find comp building and said what we have is prime or a plus real estate and that's what everybody wants the best location and it's not that it's brand new and that kind of stuff like the General Motors building we own it it's doing great and we've got people that just like if you have any open space let us know we want you know because they people want that really good space and it's not tech companies right now it's it's the service providers it's um you know accountants lawyers mm -hmm. and um financial advisors and wealth managers that are you know they want really nice attractive space for their clients to come to so that top they call it like you know 10 percent of class a is actually doing really really well so, even, in, even in the big urban centers uh yeah i mean in new york uh -huh. and uh you know i'm 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 on the board of arden group out of philadelphia and and our our prime class a stuff is actually doing very well you know suburban and b and c really really tough times hmm. really tough times so i think we're going to see uh, a lot more of handing the keys back mm -hmm. on those buildings and what the banks end up doing with those is up in the air but i i think that's that's the biggest risk in the real estate world right now is what do we do with all these you know non-prime office buildings that probably aren't going to refill and just reading somebody else's report this morning as you know as economists the idea is uh, to uh, forecast often yeah. some people are saying it's not gonna we aren't gonna be back till 2040 it's gonna take that long for the vacancy rates back in by 2040 right right, right it's gonna be that long before before you know the general overall office market comes back yeah you, I mean by my um tell me if I got the numbers wrong this, this is in my mind's eye and I might not have it right but uh, there's uh, roughly $400 billion in office mortgages that are coming due that need right. to be refinanced, rolled over between yep. now and the end of 2025. Yeah. So $400 billion and about $100 billion uh, is uh, uh, on, the banks are on the hook for. So uh, does that sound about right to you? Yep. All right. Yep. So, and go ahead. There's There's going to be some pain. Right, right. But at that hundred billion in the grand kind of scheme of things, if you look at a commercial bank, the commercial banking system as a whole, that's that's really not much to worry about. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really the uh, maybe the some 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 institution on the tail of the distribution is going to get caught uh, because they have too much CRE and right. they get caught with the wrong CRE, have right. a default, and they might choke on that and fail. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So industrial, on the other hand, is just off the charts. Fantastic. Uh, things are going well. Uh, it's become a lot more expensive to build. You, before, before you go into industrial, though, let me just let's explore the office a little bit, because that's the sure. soft spot, right? Yeah. Because that, yeah, yeah. So uh, do you, con there's a, a number of uh, kind of significant headwinds to the office market. Curious to get your take on how big a deal they are and whether they're going to continue. The first one is obviously remote work and the remote right. dynamic, and that, that that clearly has had an impact on the kind of the large office towers and big urban centers in the Northeast, Chicago on the. Yep. On the yeah. it, it, do you think that's a dynamic that's here to stay? We're going to continue on with that. That's going to play a role going forward. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, because everybody wants to work at home on Mondays and Fridays and be in the office three days a week. Um, and so you need less space per person. The historic average was 200 square feet per person. And I think it's going to, you know, and and it when when we started doing uh, more um, uh, work at home, virtual stuff, some people were cramming down to like 120 square feet per person. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh you know, if you can figure out how to sp spread the peanut butter out over the bread during the week, you know, maybe it's down to half that in the long run. Uh, but uh, older, older people like you and I, I'm, I'm happy working from home. It's no problem. I'm not worried about my next promotion. Most of my, most of my undergrad and grad students, my grad students who are MBA, you know, who are, who are, who are master students who are, who are working, they're like, 
you know, if I'm not in the office, I'm going to get overlooked for the next promotion or this or that or the other thing. They want to be in the office. And if they're living downtown, they don't want to be working from their 500 square foot, uh, you know, efficiency apartment. Um, you know, they like going into the office and the socialization and stuff like that. So it'll be really interesting to see how everything kind of, you know, filters out um, as we as we go through all this. But, but like I say, I, I think we're we're coming up with a new trend that's going to take that decade plus to yeah. just sort itself out. What about at conversions? You know, there's some some chatter right. about converting office into multifamily. We need multifamily being the most obvious, right? You think and that really has any uh, legs? Is that viable? There, there, there is some, and not that many unique buildings that you can do that with, uh -huh. because uh, um, uh, you know, uh, one of my good friends, Tom Toomey at United Dominion Realty, that REIT, um, they've done a couple conversions. He said. When you take a normal office building that's got a big floor plate to it, what you end up with is little shotgun narrow, 10 or 15 foot wide by 80 to 100 foot deep units. So you get one window, right? Right. And uh, there's only so many people that want something that small and, and, and unique. And the cost of conversion is so high that economically it's not viable. So we're going to see some of that, but it's not the be all and end all of it. I had a student in my development class do a project where they converted an office building and all of our office building in Denver into self-storage. Hmm. And it worked financially, which was amazing. The one thing was it had concrete columns supporting the floors. And with storage, the floor load went, went up. And they came up with the coolest solution. This guy was an engineer. Uh -huh. They wrapped the columns in graphite to give them the strength needed to uh -huh. do it. So it was a really inexpensive way to do that conversion, right? Also, self storage, uh, you know, self storage um, close in warehouse is another potential because if it's got a parking garage underneath, the mm. trucks can come and go. Um, you know, the the you know the, the Amazon trucks can come and go. They can bring stuff up and down in the elevators, that kind of stuff. So that's that's another potential. Um, First, can you imagine turning Seven World Trade, that's a Moody's HQ, into a right. big warehouse space? Right. Actually, storage. it's a very secure building. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out. There's got to. That's I, I, that's the main thing about uh, commercial real estate. It's always amazed me. CRE developers, you know, they're so creative. You know, you can. Yeah. How are they going to get out of this box? And somehow they do. Every single right. time they get out of the box, they figure it out. Right. Yeah. And maybe maybe you know some of the suburban office buildings can be converted to. Other things like that too, because they got plenty of parking and everything else. But it'll be, you know, it's like you say, it's yeah, we're waiting for the next creative thing to come along. Yeah, we, you know, Glenn, uh, uh, econo the economics unit within Moody's, that's us. You know, we right. just went remote, fully remote, uh, what, six, eight weeks ago, something like that. And nice. uh, our office building in uh, Malvern, or excuse me, Westchester, PA is, you know, now, now empty. Pretty empty. Uh, right. So, uh, right. And um, why not? Yeah. Life, life is e life is uh, easier. The the amount of time you know, if, if we think back over our careers, the amount of time that we spent commuting. Yeah. If you had that to do something else with. Yeah. You know. Could, could have written another couple books, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Chris. Let me ask you. I mean, uh, yeah. what do we we uh, Glenn we collect all the transactions and create these repeat sales, uh, commercial real estate price indices and uh, model them, forecast them. A lot, you know, our, a lot of our um, clients use them for stress testing and all kinds of different risk management, that kind of thing. Chris, what are we, what are we expecting prices to be down peak to trough in the office market? For office, 25%. 25. Does that sound right to you, Glenn? I know you don't do explicit forecasting. and Right. Right. Well, you know, um, in the Great Recession, uh, we dropped prices by 40. Yeah. And then they bounced back within four years and we're up, you know, uh, multifamily was up like 240 over the previous peak. Um, uh, actually, uh, mobile home parks was the was the highest, you know, uh, up over mm -hmm. that time frame. So um, I, I think 25 is 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 conservative i i you know okay. that that could be the number but i'm i'm kind of guessing a little bit worse, <laughs> worse. That's, what, that's what i've heard what do you think chris 
That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. that's what I've heard. Although I, yeah, you know, that number has real implications, right? For, right. For folks. Although, so although remember sensitive. that, you know, after the Great Recession, banking went from 75% loan to value loans down to 60 in most cases. So you can have a 40% value drop before you're, you know, before you're, before you're out of the money. And, and, you know, think of this, that in essence, anyone that has a loan on a building, they basically have a put option, right? Or a call option, yeah. if you will, that if, if the price drops below the mortgage value, yeah. I walk away. If right. it doesn't, I just keep collect, you know, as long as, as long as I'm collecting enough rent to pay the mortgage, I don't need to walk away, right? If I'm not collecting enough rent, or if I've calculated that in the next year or two, I've got enough leases coming due that that don't pay, uh, uh, you know, then that then I also walk away. And as you probably know, the the uh, subleasing situation, we've almost tripled the amount of sublease space on the market. So you've got somebody like Moody's, who I assume is, you know, on the hook on a 10 year lease and maybe you only have a year or so left on it. And and if you guys are all working from home, they probably put it on the sublease market. Will someone take it for a year? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. But mm -hmm. you know, so that you know that that's the forerunner of where vacancy rates are going. Is you know the amount of sublease space tells you that vacancy is about to rise. So do you see this playing out over time, or is it a, a yeah one time shot? Because I mean, you've got you've got like I say you know with with average five to ten year leases over the next five to eight years. We're going to see all this stuff, uh, you know, come come due. All right. So, so that's office. Anything else on office you want to bring up, Marissa or Chris, that, that I missed? Well, um, I just I imagine that twenty five percent price drop. You know, as Glenn was saying, probably varies quite a bit depending on the the type of office space you're talking about, right? Like right. you were, and I've heard this before that now Class A doesn't really mean much because it's got to be top of the line class a so right. that stuff right. probably does better right than some of the more suburban class b class c um right. office buildings right so so in denver we have two iconic buildings right the wells fargo building which looks like a cash register on the top mm -hmm. right across the street republic plaza blackstone was 50 percent owner in both of those and they handed the keys back to the bank here a couple months ago and just, yeah, you know, that. we have leases come and do and everything else by our numbers. It, you know, we're not going to make any money. So it's yours. And, yeah. and now they're older, they're, you know, 20 to 30 year old buildings. So mm -hmm. they they are the right location. Had they been, you know, remodeled and stuff like yeah. that, they could probably be premier A's, but they're old A's, uh, which, you know, didn't work. Also, you know, what you have to do is, uh, you know, as my market cycle work, I look at the 54 top cities in the marketplace. There are some that are doing really well. Others where you had a lot of new space coming online, like, you know, Denver just had the new Tabor Center 2 come online. And the firm that bought my Aries Capital Management, they took the three top floors mm -hmm. and then asked any of their, any of their other uh, people in New York, San Francisco, anybody want to move to Denver? And they got a whole bunch of people coming in. They started with two floors and went to three. So all of a sudden, the newest brand new Class A in Denver, the top three floors are taken kind of thing. And uh, the Boston properties in their presentation, they said, we have three clients who are looking for 100,000 square feet or more in New York City right now. Really? Yeah. Hmm. But and there's no, and, and that's in a, in a premier building and it's yeah. not available. Yeah. So. uh I guess the question is it, sort of my thought process is that for these issues we're talking about in the office market, which is kind of the, the poster child for the concerns, because as you point out, right. we'll come back to it in a second, in these other property types, the issues aren't nearly as serious. It doesn't not, feel that, yeah, they're they're right. almost, uh, I'm going to say non-serious. Non-serious, not a problem. Yeah, not yeah. A problem. yeah. So, and if you want, let's, let's go ahead and run through what's but I going wanna, on. But I just want to kind of, do Close one more that. thing there, and that is, uh, you know, the kind of the link back to the broader economy would be if the default, say, prices fall, uh, uh, you know, more Blackstones hand back the keys to the bank, uh, a, a bank then uh, chokes on that, and uh, the losses are overwhelm their capital base, and the right. regulator says, look, 
you're insolvent, I'm, you're, you're no longer viable, I'm shutting you down, or you're gonna merge with somebody or you're gonna be acquired by somebody, uh, that uh, then that could, uh, if it were widespread enough, you know, be a, a problem for the availability of credit more broadly and, and therefore the macro economy. But in this case, it doesn't feel like that's at all possible because we're not talking about numbers that are big enough. 100 billion over the next three years doesn't right. feel like that's big enough. The other way, it, I guess it could have an impact broadly on the economy is if a smaller bank or mid-sized bank choked, failed, and that reignited kind of the deposit runs that we saw back a few months ago. So you got okay. you got folks out there, depositors, <clears throat> got a lot of cash in the bank, very kind of skittish, nervous. Right. And even if a small bank that's not by itself systemically important, by itself, if it fails, no big deal. But if it kind of ignites another run, people say, oh, I'm out of it. I'm, I'm pulling all my money out. I'm going into money funds or I'm put it all right. my money into these big guys, you know, maybe I, I, that's the only way I can see this thing metastasizing into a broader kind of macroeconomic issue. Right. Is, well, is that your I, view? Is that how you think yeah, about it? And, and I guess I'm going to ask you then a question because I, this is something I've never studied. How much, how much capital is in the large banks that are too big to fail that the federal government would obviously come in and just bail out like a Wells Fargo, U.S. bank, whatever, versus all these smaller banks, you know, is it like 50% of all the money is in small banks and 50% in big banks? Or is it 80, you know, I don't know the magnitude size between those. That would be a good thing to look at to say, hey, if 20% of all, you know, uh, of all this money is in these smaller banks and that's what's going away, 20% isn't so bad, right? Yeah, I think for the if big it's 50%, guys, then it's a big problem. Yeah, of course, I'm curious if you have a different view, but it, for the big guys, you know, the big guys that take the stress test every year, you know, they right. they have to uh, stress their balance sheet, including right. their CRE portfolio against that 40% decline you mentioned and peak to trough right. decline. That's what's used generally. In fact, in this last stress test, it was more than that, wasn't it, Chris? I was, think it was 45 or 50% down. And that's across all CRE, right? That's not right. just office. That's the whole shoot match. So that's a pretty severe, you know, financial crisis-esque plus kind of decline. And, yeah. and they got to have enough capital to, you know, digest that. And and they do. So the big guys, guys that take the stress test, I, I just, I don't, I don't, they're, they're bulletproof. Right. Smaller guys, they, you know, they don't take, you know, if you're below, you know, before SVB, you know, it was 250 billion and below. That's going to change now because of what right. happened with SVB. But, right. you know, 250 below, you don't, have the same kind of stress testing demands the big guys have. So there could be failures there. But again, you know, unless it, it creates a deposit run for some reason, people lose their minds irrationally. I'm not sure, which could happen for sure. You know, my 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 uh, mother-in-law, nine, 93-year-old uh, mom has and I probably shouldn't say that. It's some some cash in bank. Well below the deposit insurance limit, she goes, uh, you know, should I be worried about that? This was back in the, you know, in March, April, when things were, you know, uh, very unnerving. I said, mom, don't worry, no problem. You know, you're below the deposit insurance limit. And she seemed okay. A few minutes later, she came back and she said, uh, honey, what do you do, do again for a living? <laughs> <laughs> Can you remind me? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Just to see if I have standing. Chris, do I have that right? I mean, I'm, Marissa, am I missing anything? How, what else, what, how else could this thing, the problems in the office market, kind of metastasize more broadly in the economy? No? Yeah, no, I think that's it's a, it's a okay. confidence issue more than anything, right? But okay. There, right. there are these bank runs, and then we have a repeat of what happened in the spring. Right. And remember, you know, the balancing act here, the stock market's up 17% and doing okay. And people typically feel all right. With yeah. Them. So, right. and um, the worry about a recession, um, actually, and, and you're the guy I wanted to ask this question to, is when I look back since the 60s, every time we've had a quote unquote recession, both employment and GDP go negative, right? Yeah. This time, while I can see easily GDP going negative later this year, potentially, I don't see employment growth 
going negative because we got so many jobs out there that are unfilled and everything else. So anybody that wants a job can certainly go get one. And now that uh, you know the the the, the COVID money is gone and everything else, uh, people can't live on <laughs> nothing. You know, can't can't live off the government. Um, is it really a recession if if employment growth is positive and, and GDP is negative? No, no. I, you're speaking my language, Glenn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think businesses are very, very reluctant to lay off workers because, you know, on the other side of whatever it is we're experiencing now, they know they're going to have a boatload of difficulty of hiring people and, and retaining right. people. Just to, given demographics, it's going to be very difficult. Right. This is actually a statistic. Uh, 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 this won't be, we have a statistics game and we won't play the game, but I'll throw it out there and see if people know the answer. So the average monthly job growth over the past decade has been 170K. You know, that right. you go back to 2013, right. 10 years, pandemic, everything, 170K. Guess what uh, it's going to be over the next 10 years, uh, according to our forecast and, and most others, you know, CBO, everyone that does this forecasting, just given demographics and what it means for the growth in the supply. Well, and, and so this is net you and me retiring with other people coming yeah. to take our place, right? It, it's going to exactly. be, I'm, I want to say probably just slightly less than that, maybe 150? 75K at best. Half. Half. Okay. Well, it was 170, 170, now you know, 175, now it's 75, you know, something like that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It gives you a sense of magnitude. I know. I know it was a lot less. Yeah. A lot less. A right. lot less. A lot less. And by right. the way, these forecasts were done well before the pandemic. If you go back and look at our forecasts, right. you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, because you, it's, you know, we knew the boomers, you and I are going to retire. Right. At some, well, you'll never retire. Uh, and th these guys are going to have to kick me out. I'm not retiring. You're not retiring. Right. <laughs> right. But anyway, so, okay. So, all right. So we just focused on the weak link in the CRE market. Right. Poster child for all the concern office. And we came to the conclusion that this ain't great. It's going to be an adjustment. Certainly there's going to be a lot of losers in all this, but it's not existential for the financial system or the broader economy. Correct. I mean, we kind of came to that conclusion. Correct. Okay, fine. Okay. What, what, and, and then the rest of the CRE market, uh, what else out there? Is there anything, because I'm all, I'm looking for things that could, uh, you know, kind of hurt the economy, undo the economy. Is there anything else out there scouring, you know, because I know you scour the physical markets, you scour the capital markets, you look at the private market, you look at the public market, anything else out there that is making you nervous about about the not, not only no but absolutely no and absolutely I'll, no and and i'll and i'll tell you why and I, I can start from worst and go to best or best and go to worst you pick mercy your choice let's go worst to best okay. <laughs> right. let's okay. end on a high note so, so, let's end okay, on a high good. note. all right okay. so i think the worst out there is hotel okay and the reason for that is bifurcate between the resort and leisure and off and and business hotel and mm. business hotels we closed a number of them in new york things are kind of bad there the one thing that happened the little detail that a lot of people don't understand about hotels is when you know i own a hotel that's flagged by marriott marriott requires me every 10 years to completely remodel the place at about a hundred thousand dollars a key right so i am escrowing every year to be able to do my hundred thousand dollar room remodel at the end of ten years, Marriott doesn't pay for that. And uh, in the pandemic, they said, "Okay, you can use that escrow money to make your mortgage payment, to keep things going, all that kind of stuff." And uh, now it's like, "Okay, now things are back." You know, by the way, your remodel is going to be due <laughs> again, anyway. And so I think uh, from a we're, we're going to we're going to see a number of owners who don't have the capital mm -hmm. put those properties up for sale. So we have, if you will, kind of a, I use I've used this term now for a couple of years. We've got the COVID have and the COVID have not properties, right? They're going to do it now. Everybody's raising their rates like crazy um, as well, and um, and everybody used the COVID money they couldn't spend to go out and do leisure travel. Mm -hmm. That's starting to fall off. With the with the high dollar value, international travelers weren't coming into the U.S. either. So that you know, kind of that 
the, the U.S. people come in and kind of balance that out. I think now that, especially if you have a recession, people back off here in the U.S. and the international travelers still aren't coming. So to me, hotel is the, you know, is is the number one most risky of the property types after office. So, so the business travelers that are they, I haven't been following. Are they making their way back? In um, yeah, but you're no longer in your office. Someone's not coming to come. Is not coming to, to see you. That's true anymore, right? And and as a matter of fact, I just read a new little report about the fact that now most people are at the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday travel is picked up, but Monday, Friday is yeah. is is getting worse, not better. Yeah. Too. So now you got a hotel. You know, and hotels normally live off of um, the historic number used to be a 62% of what was break-even occupancy. And we've got the leisure hotels up up in the 80s and the business hotels still in the pick the city 50s, 60s type of thing. So so hotel to me is is the next riskiest thing. But there have been like dozens of hotel opportunity funds started and that kind of stuff, um, I'm actually invested with uh, some of the Marriott lineage and a little opportunity fund in in that area um, to you know try and pick up some great deals. Well, this might be a good spot to do a little bit of a deviation, then we'll come back to your west of what worst to best, right? Um, and that is uh, in these large urban centers where uh, you know people are leaving. Remote work is uh, playing a role. These office towers are going empty. That's also affecting uh, retail uh, and uh, uh, and some of these, uh, like San Francisco is now the poster child for this. It, it, you got um, things kind of feeding on themselves. So right. pro property prices are down. Uh, that's uh, affecting uh, tax revenue and the ability for government, uh, local government to provide uh, public services, including uh, safety. So crime is becoming more of an issue. Homeless yeah. is more of an issue. And you're getting into this kind of self-reinforcing, very net negative dynamic. Right. What's your sense of that? How you know is that? Uh, how big a deal is that? And is, is there any turning that around? I I, I think it's potentially a big deal. Big deal. Um, you know, the younger generation has loved living downtown, working downtown, doing all the things they're doing. And as these, uh, you know, as this crime raise, you know, goes up and stuff like that. And and you know restaurants aren't open every day and all those kinds of things. They're thinking about moving out to the suburbs. Um, one of the neighbors over here, young couple, newly married, um, living the life downtown. Both working downtown for big firms, and uh, she walked out to her car one day and got robbed by gunpoint. She says, "We're out of here." Bought a house, actually, bought his grandmother's house here on the lake. Mm. And now they're living here. So um, I and right now the 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 biggest demand out there is for single family home rentals mm. out in out in the out in the submarkets if, if they don't have you know the down payment for the to buy the house, um, you know they're 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 renting. So um, that's that's yeah. And and you're right, cities have a major financial problem. With the fact that the revenues and you know i saw a number recently like tax revenue down almost a trillion dollars in major cities without yeah. you know without the rental uh without the rent with, with without the taxes and the rental income and the sales taxes from you know people going out to lunch and, and shopping and everything else so yeah that's 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 the other big risk yeah that's there yeah um okay let's go back to the west uh, the worst to the best can right. i take a crack at guessing what the next one is sure warehouse um no okay. i would say I would, <laughs> I would say retail oh you'd say retail okay yeah, right and and the big reason for that is you know retail got hurt after the great recession and the amazon effect and all that kind of stuff yeah we slowed down new supply substantially and uh, we converted a lot of retail. As a matter of fact, the best thing to happen to retail was marijuana. You took uh, all the old crappy retail and you turned it into a, a marijuana dispensary, right? My first job when I graduated, because I was in, there, there, there was a big recession in 1974 and I couldn't find a job. So I just turned around and applied to and got into grad school. I worked as a mechanic at the Ferrari dealer in Denver. Wow. 
that well, you know, like a mile from a mile from the DU campus, and it's now a medical. It's now a marijuana dispensary. Oh, oh amazing, <laughs> amazing. So um, retail has been really restricted in supply. You had the COVID haves and COVID have nots. The COVID have, if you were deemed a necessary uh, retailer, which was building materials, obviously grocery stores, all that kind of stuff your sales went up. And when your sales go up, it's like, hey, I'm doing something right. I need more stores. And they are, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, building new stores, doing that kind of stuff. Hardware stores doing well. Um, uh, and um, so last year, 80% of all new retail built was pre-leased. Hmm. Fast food chains, all that kind of stuff, hmm. all doing really well. And we also converted a lot of stuff uh, over a decade ago from retail into some office into, you know, now close in warehouse, other things like that. So retail is in kind of a balancing act. I put that next only because if we do have a recession, their sales go down. Some of them can't afford to pay their rent kind of thing. Uh, so but it's going from West worst to best. And that sounded pretty good to me. So <laughs> right. okay. it's going from best to best or to bestest. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so next in line is industrial. Industrial and industrial, you know, the Amazon effect created huge, yeah. uh, huge benefits, as you know. And every retailer, if they're going to survive, every big retailer, if they're going to survive, needs internet presence. So they need warehouse space. Amazon was gobbling up so much of it. In 2019, Amazon leased 25% of all space leased in the United States. And think about this we're going along at uh, over five years, eight to nine to 10 to 11 to 12% of retail sales. We're online, right? Mm -hmm. And then COVID hits and it goes to 18. Mm -hmm. That's a 50% increase. What did Amazon do? Whoa, demand's up 50%. They went up and just started leasing everything under the sun, building stuff themselves, everything else. And then COVID ends and it drops back to 12 and a half percent. So we're back on the old trajectory. And they go, oops, we took too much. Well, that's why I, why said, you, that's why I said warehouse. That's yeah. why that's what I was yeah. thinking when I right. said and, and so they said, oops. We took too much and they put it up for sublease or or walked yeah. away from a lease and this stuff like that. But then all the retailers who weren't able to beat Amazon out. Got them. They're got them. Oh, and by the way, every time a state legalizes marijuana, yeah, it immediately takes care of the warehouse <laughs> problem. Right? I, I'm sensing a theme here. Yeah. yeah. So in, maybe they so, can turn those office properties into something, you know, right, <laughs> right. marijuana. So, yeah, you that. Bingo, Mark. Bingo. That, that you could be the icon savior of office <laughs> with that idea. I love that, right? We can marry the two. Uh, maybe, maybe we could make you know take the windows out and make them greenhouse grow. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of That'd be perfect. Yeah. yeah. So um, warehouse. So in Denver, when we legalized in Colorado, legalized marijuana over a decade ago, rents were three bucks a square foot. They went to six. The cost. Cost to break even cost to build new was about 450 a square foot. Uh -huh. We went to 100% occupancy and we grew, 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 grew. Everything was great. And then other states started to legalize. So we were having a lot of marijuana tourism. So it started to fall off. We've now had marijuana uh, companies actually go out of business. Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden we have a, we have a, we, and we were building warehouse. We're now at national average, we're at 11 bucks a square foot for warehouse space. Right now, costs have gone up too, but all these retailers are needing that. One of the things we're really short on is is a cold storage warehouse. The average cold storage warehouse for food and stuff like that, mm. forty years old in this country, mm. and so we need a lot of new refrigerated warehouse space. So the demand there is like off the charts, mm. excellent because Amazon's delivering and it has to come from a refrigerated warehouse, right? So right. so yeah. I think industrial does well. And then the number one yep. uh, best property type over the next minimum of a decade is yep. apartment. And it's because, and you probably- I'm sorry, what? We apartments, number one. Apartments, oh, apartments, yeah. Because yeah. we are 6.5 million housing units short in this yeah. country, according to the latest National Association of Realtors number. And that's living units, whether it's ownership or rental. Yeah. Okay. Because, and I used to be a home builder back in the seventies and eighties. And we had a saying back then, carry kills. If I built a spec house 
And back then, this is when interest rates were high. If you remember, you know, 10-year treasury hit hit uh, 15% in, in uh, 1980, right? 80, 81. Yeah. Um, if I finished a house and I didn't sell it in nine months, the interest on my construction loan ate up all my profit. Mm -hmm. So all of the major home builders in the Great Recession, when they were sitting on inventory that wasn't selling, they went, okay, we're not going to put 100 houses up in the Denver market hoping that they sell. We're going to, we're going to, you know, only start the next house once one sells. So our production went from 2 million a year to 1 million a year to half. So over a decade, we were short a million units a year, almost. We had the big growth in the millennial generation that soaked up some of that, right? And we built a lot of apartments downtown. They're almost, when I, when I was, my first job was at United Bank of Denver in downtown Denver, there was nobody living downtown. You could have laid down on 16th Street, the main street, that's the mall now, in, at six o'clock at night and not gotten mm -hmm. run over. You know, everybody, you you stopped working right at five o'clock, you had a drink at a bar and you were back home at six o'clock. That was it, right? Now they're, you know, they built thousands and thousands and thousands of apartments in downtown and it's thriving. It's a, you know, 18 hour, not 24 hour. Mm. So, so, so there, whether it's apartment or ownership, it's there and really simple math. My students say, should I buy a house now? I go, because I'm going to wait for interest rates to come back down, then I can afford more. And I go, let's do some simple math here. For a round number, you make $100,000 a year. 30% of that qual you know, can go towards your mortgage. So 30 grand a year towards a mortgage. When mortgage rates were 3%, 30 grand divided by 0.03 means you can afford a million dollar mortgage. Now mm -hmm. rates are 6%, right? Mm -hmm. 30 grand divided by 0.06 is a $500,000 mortgage. Yep. That's math. And yet housing prices really haven't come down much. Why? because we are short and every, all the young people that my grad students who have bought homes, they're like, I'd like to move to another home, but my, if I buy a home of the same price I sell for, my mortgage payment's going to double. I'm not going to move. So we've just shut down or slowed that, you know, that transition move up or, or to a different place or whatever. I, I think we've, we've slowed housing mobility with these higher interest rates. Yeah. The only thing on apartments is in the near term, there's a, some adjusting to do, right? Because you've got, oh, yes. you got about a million, we got a data point this week from census. So there's about a million record number, million apartment units in the pipeline going to completion. They have got, all got bottled up because of the pandemic and supply chain, labor market issues. Right. Yep. They're, they're coming to completion right. in the next 12, 18 months. And you got demand that's a, a week because rents are so high given the surge back a year ago that you, know, you got demand destruction, the households haven't been forming. So I, I agree with you about apartments over the next 10 years, and that's how you couched it. But it feels right. like in the next year or two, there's some adjusting to do. Oh, I, I absolutely agree there. And I'll give you the fun example. So one of the young people that worked for me, she was in a 500 square foot apartment in Denver in the newest building with every amenity under the sun, full LA fitness size gym, swimming pools, commercial kitchen with a guest chef that came once a week for a cooking class, right? She's in 500 square feet, two grand a month. She, COVID hits and she's like working on her bed every day, right? And so she and four and three other friends rent a house out in the suburbs for a year. And then COVID's over. So she comes back, goes back to the same building. I want my apartment back. Great. But now the rent's 2,500 bucks. And she goes, wow, 25% increase. I can't afford that. So she doubles up with another friend and gets a two bedroom for three grand. Right. And and so we just took, you know, demand for two right. housing units and turned it into one. Right. And I, I think that, you know, that that big increase in the major high growth cities there, you know, they had they had a 12 to 25 percent, you know, increase in rents. Rents are going to fall there in the Midwest, as you probably looked at those numbers, too. They had a, like a five to six percent rent increase and they're still getting that because yeah. they didn't go they didn't go crazy from that standpoint. So uh, I agree that we've got a, we've got a correction in rent growth happening, but the demands are, if the, if the rate comes down enough, be back, no problem. You know, yeah. my, my, my youngest son's an airline pilot. He bought, he bought a house to remodel and rehab and then sell and flip. Um, I don't know where he got those ideas in his head. <laughs> and, and, and he, 
you know, the, the, um, uh, he, he, he knew that it was going to be worth literally a million and a half dollars when he finished. And then the whole rate increase started and everything else and going, you know what, I'm just going to try the market for the heck of it. He puts it on the market for what he thought it would be worth at the peak a year ago, sells it in four days. Wow. For full wow. Wow. in Denver, because the demand it he's, in, he was in the right neighborhood, you know, he was in the right place. I don't know where he learned that either, other than he got his undergraduate <laughs> degree in real estate with me. You know, he was in the right place at the right time. And now he's out there looking and having a hard time finding something. Fortunately, he's got a, a duplex that he can live in while he's. Well, uh, that, that was a great tour around the CRE market. I, and I, I have to say, I feel actually a lot better after this conversation. Uh, Chris, what do you, Chris is the lugubrious one of the bunch. Any pushback, Chris? I mean, you must be feeling better too, no? Yeah, a little better. A little better. Okay. All right. Very good. Except for office. Right. You know, price. Price pessimistic of office. Right. Price corrections. Like I say, I, I think that outside of office, all the other property types are going to be generating enough rent that they can pay their mortgages. Uh, although we, you know, we'll see a few, you know, unique things happening here or there where somebody bought at the highest price. Yeah. Right. And now they're. And now their mortgage is coming due and, and with a price correction, you know, let's say it's 10% in apartments and industrial and maybe 15 in retail. And all of a sudden they can't, you know, they can't afford the higher, the higher, uh, you know, the higher mortgage rate. But, um, you know, outside of office, I, I think uh, we're going to do fine. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take it. Uh, that, that's, that's good news. I'm going to run with it because uh, it makes me feel better. But I want to thank you, Glenn, for uh, taking time with us today. It was uh, very helpful. And it's good to see you. And I hope to have you back on if we can get you yeah. back on. Yeah. That'd be great. great. Yeah. Well, dear listener, with that, we're going to call this a oh, oh, podcast. Actually, oh, one, yeah. one, last, one last really yeah. quick thing. Yeah. Tell me whether you agree with this. The world yeah. is still just a wash in cash. You know, I'm dealing with, you know, if you look at the institutions, they've, they've all got funds, you know, opportunity funds to go in and do things with. Um, and I've been working in the family office, wealthy family thing. They've all got cash and they're all trying to, you know, do opportunity stuff, et cetera, that, you know, anytime there's a deal, it's going to, you know, that that's going to sell. And that I think will help keep a little bit of a floor under, you know, too much of a price drop. Yeah. Just, the only thing I worry about there is, uh, in terms of credit, you know, the banks are tightening and they are going to be more cautious in extending out credit. Right. So. But you know, I mean, a lot of stuff is selling. It's amazing. You know, my son sold a million and a half cash buyer. Is that right? Cash yeah. buyer. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I, I mean, I think that's where the, you know, there's, there is cash, uh, but um, uh, I think in terms of the availability of credit, yeah. you know. At least is it enough for unleveraged purchases yeah. is the question. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, so that suggests some price adjustment here. I can't imagine we're not going to see some. Oh yeah, some no. price, some increase in cap rate, but but yeah, to your point, uh, you know, I'm 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 on board. I I think your optimism is well justified. But before anyone dashes my optimism, I'm going to call this a podcast. Uh, thanks, Glenn. We'll talk All to right. you, soon. dear listener. Thanks, we'll catch you at the next uh, podcast. Take care now.